Okay, welcome along ladies and gentlemen to your weekly SETI seminar series and the first for 2010. Uh, we're honoured to have uh, our guest speaker today is Dale Cruikshank. Uh, Dale uh, started off his uh, uh, scientific career in Iowa at, uh, where he grew up uh, and he went to University of Arizona where he uh, was a PhD student with Gerhard Kuiper. Uh, he'll be talking about uh, that work uh, in his talk today. Uh, uh, Dale has specialised in the spectroscopy of ices. Um, with, uh, after he uh, was at University of Arizona, he uh, spent time at uh, University of Hawaii um, before he came to uh, NASA Ames, where he has remained ever since uh, 1988, I believe. Um, Dale has uh, carved out, out a career of uh, looking at ices on small bodies uh, well outside of Earth's orbit, uh, but still within our solar system. And uh, that's what he's going to talk to us uh, today about in his, uh, in his seminar. So if you'll join me in welcoming Dale. Thank you. Thanks very much, Adrian, uh, and especially for the invitation to come and speak today. I'm astonished to see the size of the crowd. I guess it's a testament to the drawing power of peanut butter. <laughs> um, but anyway, I thank you for being here at the end of a no doubt busy uh, holiday season for everyone. Um, I want to talk today about uh, really three topics that fold in together uh, in, I think, interesting ways. And they also represent the things that I've been working on most recently. The, um, the fact is also that uh, my colleagues in several of these endeavors are uh, among you in the audience today, and so it's nice to, nice to see them here as well. The three topics that I want to cover are, are, the, uh, um, are shown here. The issue of the presence of hydrocarbons detected on some of Saturn's satellites with the Cassini spacecraft, which is still in, uh, in, in active business in orbit around Saturn. I want to talk about carbon dioxide, which we've also found on some of the satellites of Saturn and what uh, interesting story that may have to tell. And then a more recent discovery, which isn't yet fully published, but was presented at the AGU meeting in mid-December. Um, that's the uh, detection of hydrogen cyanide on the surface of Triton. And then at the end, I w and as I progress through it, I want to try to uh, note the relevance of these issues uh, to the bigger issue of the origin and nature of the um, small bodies in the outer solar system. So this is just a, a real quick inventory sheet of what is meant by small icy bodies in the outer solar system. I'm not going to uh, talk about all of these things, of course. In fact, I've underlined Saturn, Neptune, and I'm not really going to talk about Pluto or the Kuiper Belt objects, although the implications for those I think will become apparent. So the first uh, spectroscopic detections, and by the way, I'm assuming that I don't have to explain spectroscopy to this, this crowd, so uh, we're jumping right in. And by the time I'm finished, you will have seen more spectra than you really want to, but that's kind of our, uh, th that's what I do, and it's the way that I find out what we, what we can uh, discern from the light from these objects. The first uh, detection of anything on any planetary satellite was uh, Kuiper's accidental discovery of uh, methane on Titan, uh, which showed, first of all, there's the presence of gaseous methane, and second, that uh, Titan has an atmosphere. That was the first detection of the atmosphere, um, of an atmosphere of any planetary satellite. And then, uh, and that was in 1944, when Kuiper had a break from work um, related to the, uh, to the war. And then uh, Moroz, in 1964, I think, published the first specter of the Galilean satellites, which showed the presence of uh, water ice. So this is a picture of Kuiper at about the time he made this discovery. And um, I've drawn a yellow arrow at the position of the band in this photographic spectrum uh, that shows the presence of CH4 on Titan. You can clearly see the CH4 uh, in the atmosphere of Jupiter and in Saturn. 
And these are two spectra of Titan, which show a weak absorption there as well. So that was a, an interesting and important early discovery. Moreau's found uh, by uh, moving the spectral range observable from Earth out into the near infrared, Kuiper was doing it at the same time, um, but Moreau's was the first one to publish his spectra showing the uh, water ice bands on some of the Galilean satellites. In, in the spectrum of Ganymede here, the, uh, the water ice is evident in this reduced height of the 2.2 micron um, part of the spectrum. These, by the way, all the spectra I'm showing you are spectra of reflected sunlight. So we're in the region of the spectrum where uh, the thermal contribution from the intrinsic heat of the target object is of no consequence. And in Europa, there are three bands here, uh, Moreau's public, having published those. Well, the detection of species is, is really very interesting and very important, and it's been um, uh, bread and butter for most of us for a long time. But another point I want to make here today is that we've really begun to move away from, or beyond, I should say, the mere detection of individual molecules. And now we can sort of begin to do some physical chemistry, understanding in, from the spectral data we have uh, the way molecules are attached to one another, uh, the way they interact with the substrate, whatever that might be. And uh, in some cases, as noted at the bottom, we can see processed species, that is material that is not native to the, the object itself. It comes about from the energetic uh, processing, either in the atmosphere of the satellite, as in the case of Titan, um, or energetic processing of some of the ices on a more or less airless body surface. And so I'll show the examples of some of that as we go along. Well, the Saturn satellite, uh, the entire Saturn system is a very complex system, as I think everybody is fully aware, consisting of the planets, rings, in fact, we're still finding new rings, as you may have heard, as well as a, a very uh, interesting family of satellites. And I've encircled Iapetus and Phoebe up there, because those are two of the ones that I want to talk about at least briefly here. So the first... Uh, the first slide, this slide here shows two spectra um, obtained with the visible infrared mapping spectrometer called VIMS, which is on the Cassini spacecraft. And this spectrometer works in the spectral range of about 0.3 micrometers out to a little bit beyond 5 micrometers. Not all the spectrum is shown here. And that's a part of the spectrum that you can't study from the Earth with, except for uh, some parts being uh, interrupted uh, by the Earth's atmosphere. So with the VIMS instrument, we have a, an opportunity to look at a very broad spectral range without interruptions from the Earth's atmosphere, and also up close to surfaces um, where we can actually get some spatial resolution. We can get spectra, for example, of depending on how close the flyby is of a given satellite or other object, uh, with a spatial resolution of, of a kilometer or so. Back here on Earth, we're constrained basically to seeing one entire hemisphere of one of these small bodies. We can wait for half a rotation period and see the other hemisphere, but we can't get any better spatial resolution for the most part than that. So anyway, uh, spectra here of two of Saturn's satellites, Phoebe, this object shown here with the dimensions and density that, that I've indicated. And in the case of Phoebe, we see very strong indication of water ice. We had actually picked that up from ground-based spectra before. But we see the, the spectrum now in its full extent. Uh, likewise, with the spectrum of the uh, low albedo uh, hemisphere of Iapetus, and I won't go into the, a lot of detail about Iapetus, except I think uh, most of us are aware that this object has uh, basically a hemispheric uh, dichotomy in terms of its brightness. And one hemisphere, that which is in the trailing side as Iapetus makes its way around Saturn, is covered with ice and has a very high reflectivity. Whereas the, the forward side, in the apex of its locked synchronous motion around Saturn, has a very low albedo hemisphere. Um, and that material appears to be stuff that has either deposited on there or has been um, left behind as a lag deposit as the ices evaporate. Uh, there are a couple of very interesting papers in, I think, a very recent issue of Science that, uh, that discuss that with a, a, new, a new look at the situation that is uh, very promising. But, for our purposes here, I'm interested in primarily the spectral signature and composition of this low albedo material, which is on the, the leading hemisphere of Iapetus in its orbital motion. And you can see the spectrum is quite different. This is, this we regard this uh, slope upward with increasing wavelength as red. And so Iapetus is red, 
uh, Phoebe is gray in the, in the sense that its re spectral reflectance is essentially neutral. The, the color of the sun and all that stuff has been removed from these data. But what I really want to call attention to are two uh, features that show up in the long wavelength part of the spectrum that we really can't observe well at all from the Earth. One is in this region here at about 3.3 micrometers, which is a region where hydrocarbons absorb, and we'll get to that. And then at 4.3 micrometers in round numbers, a region that also we can't observe from the ground, but where we now see in the spectra of both Phoebe and Iapetus the signature of carbon dioxide. So those are the two of the factors that I want to uh, focus on in, in my talk here today because each tells an interesting and different story. Well, in, uh, in the case of Iapetus, we've had a couple of opportunities to fly very close. Uh, one was in 2004, just as the Cassini mission was getting underway at Saturn, and once more recently in September of 2007. There are a couple more flybys scheduled over the next five years, and we all hope those are successful. But what we found was that if we examined very closely this region of the spectrum, which is on a steep slope, so it requires some interesting manipulations, that there is the spectral signature, weak as it is and ragged as the data are, at about 3.3 micrometers, 3.28 I think is the exact central wavelength, and then a hint of some other features over here. And the importance of this is that um, the 3.3 micron band is nicely matched up with uh, the CH stretching mode in aromatic hydrocarbons. And we'll get back to aromatics in just a second. But I've shown down here in the bottom the spectrum of a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, or actually a, an average of several, to indicate the position of the 3.3 micron band. Um, over here at slightly longer wavelengths is the region where um, uh, CH stretching modes occur in the aliphatic hydrocarbons. And I'll get to that just in a second as well. Now, the background to all of this is that we've been pursuing the, some kind of identification of this dark stuff on Iapetus for a very long time, like 30 years. And finally, we have a spectral signature of something that's tangible. And it is weak, and it's, but it's quite certain because it shows up in, in multiple individual data sets. And I think it's quite uh, reliably identified as a presence of at least a modest amount of these hydrocarbons, which we kind of suspected all along, just because of the low, low reflectivity and the reddish color, which is characteristic of complex molecular uh, organic complexes. Um, so yes, come. The big, big, the big, this one here. Yeah. Well, there, uh, there are two competing things. OH certainly is present, and w especially um, even though in this dark material you can't see a, str uh, a strong signature of water ice, a little bit of water must be there. So this, I think, is a combination of OH and H2O. We don't see, for example, H2O band, ice band, at 2 microns. It's principally OH, but it's also possibly N2O. It's the kind of resolution that we have OH and NH overlap can't distinguish between the two. We're trying to sort that out right now, as a matter of fact, because it's relevant to this issue of what this organic stuff is. Is it nitrogen substituted or is it pure carbon? Uh, but we're very much aware of that. It's the, kind of the elephant in the room that we're still, tr still trying to uh, explain. But for the moment, uh, believe with me, if you will, that we have found hydrocarbons on the dark side of Iapetus. And just to uh, remind us uh, uh, what's the difference between aliphatic and aromatics, uh, this is uh, a figure from some work that my friend and colleague Hiroshi uh, Imanaka published uh, several years ago that is actually um, a representation of some of the organic material in, in what's called tholins. Um, and so I've just circled here what aromatic units are. They're these typical benzene-type rings consisting primarily of carbon, a carbon skeleton. And in the case that you see here, there is the red atoms or nitrogen atoms that are substituted, which gets back to Carol's point that um, the uh, NH should also be present, especially out here where uh, nitrogen has uh, hydrogen um, atoms attached to it. And then in contrast, aliphatic units are over here, these open, uh, longer chain structures. And so those are the two terms that I use very loosely. I'm not uh, an organic chemist, but 
to my level of understanding and uh, appreciation, this is a sufficient distinction between aromatic and, um, and aliphatic units. Well, this kind of uh, spectral signature that we're seeing on Iapetus also shows up in other interesting places. And in particular, I'm showing here the spectra of three meteorites obtained by uh, uh, Connell Alexander and George Cody at the Carnegie Institution in Washington. Of, of the insoluble organic residue from three carbonaceous meteorites. You'll recognize Murchison probably. This is an Antarctic meteorite. And Tagish Lake is a strange thing that fell in Canada a few years back. The point being that um, if you remove all of the soluble organic material, such as the amino and carboxylic acids and other stuff that goes away when you use organic solvents, you're left with a, a, an insoluble residue. So going back then to the Iapetus spectrum here, I think this is from the, the 2007 observations. We see the aromatic region here, the aliphatic region here, and I've lined them up fairly well in wavelength with the Tagish Lake and the Murchison insoluble organic matter. That's the IOM. So the curious situation that we have kind of an unexplainable meteorite that looks similar to Iapetus, and the meteorites that we understand better, namely Murchison, uh, don't really look like it that much at all. Well, there's another player in this particular um, um, scenario, and that is the HAC, or hydrogenated amorphous carbon. If you take a, uh, two carbon rods in a, in a chamber uh, full of hydrogen and uh, pass an electric charge through them and produce soot, this is absorbs the hydrogen and makes hydrogenated amorphous carbon, soot. That's what the spectrum looks like in this red line here. But if you take the same material then and anneal it up to temperatures of 500, 600 centigrade, um, that material transforms into the aromatic band. And so this is the same sample, but having been heated, and the blue line is now the aromatic stuff. And so I can't help but be intrigued by the similarity of the annealed hydrogenated amorphous carbon, um, which has had a lot of the hydrogen driven off, and the, the carbon atoms have all uh, come together into making their nice aromatic um, networks. Uh, the details of what this all means, uh, so, and, and then the, the hydrogenated amorphous carbon fits that really very well. So there's, there's clearly some connection uh, among these different kinds of organic materials, and we're still puzzling um, what that all could possibly mean. So in summary of this issue of hydrocarbons on the Saturn satellites, which is, by the way, a bigger, issue, a bigger story than I've shown you here briefly, is that there are hydrocarbons uh, on these satellites similar to some meteorites and to interstellar dust. The similarity to comet organic material is still being explored, but with the stardust samples in hand and other comet data, uh, at least as a basis now for some comparison, there, there are definite differences. Uh, the basic structure of this hydrocarbon material is determined, namely aliphatic and aromatic, but the detailed identification of individual molecules, you really can't do it just from the spectral data of the kind that we have. We don't really know. This is a, a spectrum here showing a number of things, including, extra, well, including galactic dust. So dust in the diffuse interstellar medium along a very long line of sight to some nearby star. And that is the red, uh, the red dots that you see here. And they show that characteristic structure that we saw in the Murchison meteorite. The Murchison meteorite is represented here by the thick line in green. And the fit is really quite good. And even in a galaxy far, far away, um, the interstellar dust in that galaxy shows the same signature shown in the shaggy uh, blue line here. So this material may be retained from the original molecular cloud from which the sun and planets condensed. 
and or it may have originated in the solar nebula. Uh, it's possible even that processing on planetary surfaces uh, can be producing this stuff even now. The uh, infall of, of dust from uh, pulverized comets or ground up Kuiper belt objects uh, is, is steadily uh, raining down on objects in the mid and outer solar system and it may provide a continuing source of this stuff as well. So organics, uh, it seems clear that we now have a spectral signature um, d proving that, that that material is there. It helps to a degree solve this long term problem of what is the dark stuff on uh, outer solar system body surfaces. But as you can see, the amount of information is really quite limited. Uh, but I'm happy with that, having struggled with this for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it to the next generation to pick out the individual molecules. Okay, well let's move on to another t uh, topic related to the Saturn satellites and possibly related to what we just uh, described alre uh, already. And that is the um, appearance of carbon dioxide on several of Saturn's moons. These are moons that are basically icy, uh, so there's a lot of water ice that's easily detected. But now with the VIMS instrument on Cassini working in a part of the spectrum that we can't see from the ground, we're detecting the presence of carbon dioxide. This uh, very simple but uh, delightful at the same time nasty little molecule that we hear a lot about. Um, so moving on to this, back to the same slide I showed you before, but now I want to call your attention to this spectral feature over here in both Phoebe and Iapetus, uh, which when enlarged uh, shows to be the new three stretching fundamental, asymmetric st stretching fundamental of carbon dioxide. Now you, you may know, I haven't noticed, I haven't said carbon dioxide ice or gas. The temperatures of these satellites are such that you might expect the ice, but not over a very long term because its vapor pressure um, at the temperatures of Saturn satellites is sufficient that it would normally go away in uh, astronomical time scales. But let's, uh, we'll get to that in a second. This is a picture of another one of uh, Saturn's moons. Uh, close up, this is Hyperion, a very strange world in many respects, but I find it especially intriguing that at the bottom of many of its sort of cup-shaped craters, which are not, uh, which may have originated by impact, but they've certainly been modified since. But at the bottom of many of these craters are uh, deposits of low albedo material. And curiously enough, there, the little craters in that low albedo material are most often rimmed by a white frosty rim of something. Now, the, um, the temperatures of this ob temperature of this object is about 110, 112 Kelvin. And at that temperature, water is basically a rock. It just doesn't do anything. It is, has such a low vapor pressure that it doesn't move around much. On the other hand, carbon dioxide uh, has a higher vapor pressure and is much more mobile. And I think we've seen in, in instances here in our own neighborhoods where um, morning frost will accumulate in places where it's coldest on the ground. And I think that that's the kind of thing that's happened here as well. That carbon dioxide molecules have been created or liberated or moved around and they tend to recondense in the coldest places there are. And crater rims are nice cold places because an individual surface element is radiating to a very wide field of view into cold space. And so those tend to get colder uh, and that would be a logical place for a, a, a molecule on the move to uh, settle down and, and condense. So I think, but I can't prove, that these crater rims that are seen in many places in the dark stuff, but also crater rims in the brighter material, are probably carbon dioxide. We do detect carbon dioxide on Hyperion, and I want to explore the spectrum of that just a little bit now. Well, if we plot the, um, the detailed band shapes and band positions of carbon dioxide molecules on four of, of um, the satellites of Saturn where it's been detected. We can see it weakly on one or two others. We find that the band is sort of all over the place. It does not settle down in the exact central wavelength that a similar sample of carbon dioxide, pure carbon dioxide would if we observe it in the laboratory. That wavelength in the laboratory, by the way, is over here at about 4.27 uh, micrometers, more close to the, um, to the Phoebe line, as a matter of fact. At the VIMS spectral resolution, we can't distinguish, by the way, the um, CO2 signature of, of Phoebe's um, spectrum 
from uh, pure carbon dioxide in, in the laboratory. So that, that's, I think, an interesting clue in itself. However, uh, the three other satellites shown here, Phoebe, Dione, and Iapetus, are clearly different. The bands are wider, and we're t we've taken into account the, the convolution of the, with the VIMS resolution and all that to try to make these uh, and to scale them properly so that they are uh, directly comparable. And their central wavelength is, is shifted by a considerable amount. Uh, de detecting that required a complete recalibration of the VIMS, VIMS instrument, which was an interesting experience in itself. But nonetheless, uh, we're confident now that we do know the calibration well enough to ensure that we really are seeing differences uh, from lab measurements of CO2, at least for pure CO2 ice. So what does this uh, perhaps mean? Incidentally, the, the last point on the previous slide is that on a given satellite from region to region, we can actually see differences in the central wavelength of the uh, absorption band. This is a map of a portion of, of Iapetus. It really, uh, the, the visual map is down here in the lower left, and it shows the transition region between the dark hemisphere and the bright hemisphere. And mapped up here in different colors are the, uh, the wavelength of the CO2 band. And the point of this is to show that the CO2 band moves around in, um, uh, even on a, a given satellite surface. It isn't all uh, a simple average of the whole lot. Well, that is something that requires explanation, too. So what is it that can make uh, CO2 um, molecules absorb at slightly different wavelengths and with bith different band profiles? It turns out that when carbon dioxide is complexed uh, with some other molecular material, um, it can do just that. Now, complex means that um, a CO2 molecule sitting here sees as its nearest neighbors other kinds of material rather than other CO2 molecules. When you make a sample in the laboratory of pure CO2, every carbon dioxide molecule sees nearest neighbors as uh, of a like uh, composition. And so it does its, uh, its spectral uh, vibrations accordingly. However, when you trade out adjacent and neighboring molecules um, for, and insert something else, such as water, then the interactions among the molecules are different. And that uh, is exactly, I think, what we're seeing in the case of, of uh, several of the Saturn satellites, is that the carbon dioxide occurs as a molecule here and a molecule there, and most of its neighbors are other materials. In the case of water, um, which is another abundant material on all these satellites, we can both measure in the laboratory and calculate from first principles the interaction of CO2 molecules with adjacent water molecules. And what's shown here um, on the left is a set of spectra. Um, let's see, what do we have here? Uh, okay, yes, the, uh, the red line is the measurement from, Hi from uh, the VIMS instrument of Hyperion. And it shows the very broad line or band, which is shifted to the shorter wavelengths um, as, as shown here. And I've indicated again where the pure band is dioxide, pure uh, CO2 in the laboratory occurs. So the, the shift to the shorter wavelengths seems quite clear. The, um, the dotted line labeled Prasad is a so-called type 2 clathrate in which water, uh, water molecules surround in the form of a cage an individual or possibly sometimes two um, carbon dioxide molecules. So this clathrate structure is something that's been uh, understood, or well known, I should say, here on the Earth for some time. And it turns out CO2 clathrates are something you hear about uh, on the news because of the possibility of the release of, no, I'm sorry, that, that's another clathrate. Forget what I just said, that, that's methane. We have methane clathrates too, but I'm uh, mixing my molecules here. Anyway, CO2 clathrate can be reproduced in the laboratory in these cages. But we can also, and, and then you see uh, there's one labeled Chaban up here, and that relates to calculations of the interactions of CO2 with water, uh, which were done in this case by um, Galina Chaban over at Ames in a paper that we published a couple of years ago in which she considered uh, from first molecular quantum principles the um, interactions of water uh, and CO2 molecules calculated the band position and shape, and lo and behold, it comes out to be very, very close to what we see, uh, certainly within experimental errors uh, and theoretical errors of the um, measurements that we make. So that seems to be a uh, plus other laboratory work in which um, 
Pascal Ehrenfreund and her colleagues did a lot of laboratory work on mixtures of CO2 with both methanol and water. Uh, Rachel Mastrapa has repeated some of this and her curve here is in green. And they all basically agree that in complexes that involve water and carbon dioxide um, in various combinations and proportions, that that band will move and it moves in the direction and expands into the shape that we see uh, in the case of at least Hyperion. And so different degrees of complexing and different abundances and complexing with different materials, it would appear to me, can explain the different wavelengths that we see in the, um, in the Cassini data for the satellites. Uh, these, by the way, over here are uh, just rough indications of the clathrate uh, structure, the, or the cage structure that water uh, can have. And in the, in the very bottom, there's a CO2 molecule down inside there. So this, this can occur in nature. It apparently does. And it uh, looks like something that we're seeing in, in real life on some of the satellites of Saturn. So the conclusions of here is that in the case of Phoebe, we can't really distinguish from the band shape and position whether or not it's pure CO2 or one of these clathrates. Um, and I don't have any preference, by the way. It could be native CO2 that was incorporated when this thing condensed and is still there, um, even though it would have to be constantly re-exposed because it should evaporate away in a, a billion years or so. In the case of Iapetus, some of the band shapes and positions are consistent with a little bit of pure CO2 or the clathrate. And in the case of Hyperion, it seems to be most consistent with uh, clathrates with CO2 lodged in various sites in a, in a complex water uh, matrix. Uh, that simple diagram showing a nice um, uh, polyhedron is, is, is the most idealistic imaginable because there are surely, in a, in a naturally occurring ice, a bunch of other configurations as well. Jeff, did you have a question? Yeah, Can other molecules make the cage, yeah. cages? Well, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, since certainly CO2 can adsorb onto um, uh, other materials, such as onto carbon. It can adsorb onto uh, in, in certain mineral structures. Uh, by electric field interactions with isomorphically substituted um, mineral configurations. Uh, some of this work has been done in the lab to see if, it, if, if water is the only way, in the context of the satellites, if water is the only thing. And the answer is no. Other uh, kinds of, of adsorption processes and adsorption on other materials is, is a possibility. We have a lot of water. So it's, it's a kind of a natural candidate for us to make our first start. But what we've also learned is that spectroscopy with a low resolution spectrometer, even if it's right up there in the front of Iapetus, is still not the way to do this problem because we don't have the kind of spectral resolution that we really need to see these subtle changes. I mean, we can see them, but we can't explore them in the kind of detail that would, I think, distinguish between enclathration with water or um, complexing with other, other material. Wavelength calibration, yeah. Are you pretty sure that that's all solved? Yes, in the, in, the, in the region of the CO2 band, it has been solved. But it was an interesting exercise to go back to the original calibration data taken in the lab at JPL when the instrument was first built. Um, but it was, it was all there, and we got it figured out. So. <laughs> yeah, one, one yes, quick sure. How does the complexing depend on temperature? Um, unexplored, unexplored. We, um, certainly when you, when you make a clathrate of CO2 in water in the laboratory, it, uh, it doesn't remain in that form uh, beyond a certain temperature as you raise the temperature. Rachel, do you remember how, uh, at what temperature the clathrate begins to break down, the stuff comes out? Yeah. Okay, but it hangs on to the CO2 until that point, roughly?
yeah, the cages form around these molecules, and, and it helps if you have a, a kind of another starter molecule in there to enhance this uh, uh, and speed up this process, and that's what the methanol does um, in the case of the ex most of the experiments that have been done. So temperature is an issue, but uh, if we really have to wait till the water sublimates, then we're, we're good for you know, 30 or 40 degrees because we're, we're that much colder in the Saturn satellites. So in principle, should hang on to it for a long time. Unless, of course, on the surface, the, the cage gets disrupted by a cosmic ray passing by or uh, some other energetic process that can mess that up. Okay, I want to move to another topic now, and that is Titan, or tr sorry, Triton. I always do that. I've been doing that for 30 years. Uh, Triton is the, the large satellite of Neptune, and it's down here, this tiny little dot at the bottom. And I wanted to show you, and this is actually a Voyager picture with Neptune up here and Triton down here, but as the spacecraft was approaching for the encounter in August of 1989, uh, I wanted to show you these uh, spectra that uh, Kuiper um, obtained. Actually, a, an assistant got these for him in 1989. Um, these these image, these films, and they're films, not plates, are only 15 millimeters on a side. That's very tiny. Um, and furthermore, they're infrared emulsions that were hypersensitized. And maybe Frank Drake has done some ammonia hypersensitizing in the laboratory, but I may be the only other person uh, in the audience who has. Has anyone ever done ammonia hypersensitizing of emulsions? Good man, good man. Oh, okay, okay, well, we're dating ourselves because they don't do this anymore. Um, anyway, it's, it's nasty in a dark room with a tray of open ammonium hydroxide and you're <laughs> dipping stuff into it. Uh, but anyway, the spectrum down here is the best that was obtained and then somebody got their fingerprint on it, uh, which you can see here. So exactly where the, the absorption bands that you might be looking for occur is <laughs> obscured by some guy's fingerprint. And I think it was the assistant who probably did this. But to his defense, it's, this is a hard thing to do with tiny little films in the lab. But anyway, 1949, it's a period piece, and those spectra have never been seen before. Anyway, um, in 1983, moving out into the near infrared from the ground-based spectroscopy, uh, some colleagues and I discovered uh, uh, nitrogen, molecular nitrogen on Triton. And at first we thought it had to be liquid nitrogen because you don't get this uh, a spectral absorption in nitrogen unless you have a very long path length. And the only way we could figure that you could have a path length of tens of centimeters uh, in molecular nitrogen is condensed at the temperature of Triton is if it were liquid. So we thought we had discovered a, a new ocean in the solar system and an ocean of liquid nitrogen on Triton. So Bill Hartman, um, a friend and a talented astro artist, as you know, um, hopped to and, uh, and uh, painted this picture uh, showing the liquid nitrogen ocean. Well, it wasn't too long after that that we figured out that this couldn't be liquid, the phase diagram and other factors, but you could in fact have nitrogen in the form of very large polyhedral crystals that are also very transparent. Uh, on the surface of Triton, and that this could produce the absorption band. So Bill and his colleague, Ron Miller, uh, jointly collaborated on this painting in 1993 to show the new view of Triton's surface. And by the way, four years before, we had flown by with Voyager, which did not detect directly nitrogen, but detected circumstantial evidence for it. And this uh, picture, or a portion of it, was used on the cover of the book uh, Neptune and Triton that I edited in 1995. So this, is, uh, this hangs in our hallway at home and as a treasure, because it shows a, not only the, the solid surface of Triton, but these geysers that were discovered by the Voyager spacecraft when we flew by in 89. And those are shown schematically, or artistically, I should say, over here on the left. The real uh, evidence for them is, is seen in these uh, Voyager images. And I just bring that up, and I'll make a quick reference to the geysers a little later. But note that they are black stuff, and that they blow downwind from a sublimation driven wind coming out of uh, uh, Triton's south polar region and they leave these dark streaks on the otherwise rather bright icy surface and those occur all over the south polar region. Uh, a better view of those and the wind direction I've indicated there and the streaks are, are pretty evident. So some but not all of these are uh, probably active at the time that picture was taken. Well, uh, moving beyond that uh, little fingerprinted spectrum that uh, Kuiper got back in the 40s, 
uh, we now have a lot more information about Triton and its uh, neighbor Pluto in the near infrared, the same region that uh, a portion of which, uh, well, a portion of this region is the same as the, um, as the VIMS data. And now we can see in the case of Triton, we, we don't worry about Pluto at the moment, a very interesting and rich spectrum which to my eye is a, is, a, is a treasure of art because it shows so much in this limited spectral region of about 1.5 to 2.5 micrometers. We have absorption bands of water, of methane, of uh, carbon dioxide, of nitrogen, that's the band here, as well as uh, methane, more methane, and carbon monoxide. So just in this one stretch of spectrum, you see five different ices and an isotope of uh, the 13 CO, which is over in this complex here. So tremendously rich uh, spectrum of Triton as we now look at it in more detail. And what we find is that the, uh, the methane bands, which are very prominent, um, are off-center a little bit. You know, we've got another one of these misplaced uh, absorption band problems. And it turns out that that arises because the, the methane on Triton is largely dissolved in the nitrogen. Methane dissolved in nitrogen. It is highly soluble. And so just a few atoms of, or molecules of methane in a big, chunky, uh, transparent crystal of, of, uh, of hexagonal phase nitrogen can produce a very strong absorption spectrum, and that's what we see. The nitrogen itself is in uh, the hexagonal beta phase. Uh, if the temperature were 10 degrees lower, it would transform into a cubic phase called alpha. And it does appear to occur in centimeter uh, and multiple centimeter sized grains. Uh, that can be reproduced in the laboratory, by the way. It, it loves to anneal into big crystals. The, the uh, shift in the CO2 or CH4 bands is as much as 10 wave numbers. And that is a so-called matrix shift that uh, physical chemists have known about for a very long time. Again, when you put a molecule of one material in a surrounding of other kinds of materials, the bands change. And it's the same kind of shift that we're seeing in the case of, of water, uh, of CO2, uh, but a different structural situation. But the matrix shift is, is well known, and we see that clearly in the case of the um, methane bands on Triton. I say it's entirely in the matrix of nitrogen. There may be some that's free-standing uh, CH4 as well. And in the case of Pluto, we can actually see two components in the spectrum, both the part of the CH4 that's dissolved in the methane and the part that is, uh, is essentially free methane ice. So this set of laboratory spectra over here kind of illustrates this, and I won't dwell on it, but here at the top is a methane band at 2.2 microns, which you can see in this, when it's diluted in, uh, in nitrogen, it's shifted compared to its pure version. And that's the kind of thing we see all the way down with the spectra now of Triton and Pluto. In fact, I've put a circle around the bottom of this band on Pluto, which is actually a two-component band, and uh, we see the, the two components there superimposed on one another, one caused by the methane dissolved in nitrogen and one uh, by the pure methane. Well, this the portion of the, of the Triton, so that illustrates, by the way, that we're seeing, again, a, a level of complexing. Uh, this portion is uh, based on the uh, talk that I gave at the AGU meeting, um, and I think the audience that I had there was about one-third this size. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and in this work, I, I'm uh, joined by uh, my uh, colleagues, uh, Martin Bergdorf, who's here, and, and Christina Dallaori, and other colleagues in uh, uh, JPL in Japan and France. It's a uh, multinational effort. And this uh, focuses on the detection of a new molecule on, in Triton's spectrum. Um, I showed you those spectra of Triton and uh, Pluto before, and now I'm showing you the same basic data, but with models superimposed. Models calculated from uh, using radiative transfer scattering theory, as well as uh, the optical uh, refractive indices of these materials determined in the laboratory. And the amazing thing is that the models are so good uh, they are especially good addition of some tholin, which uh, my friend Bishun Kari has shown down here on the lower left. He's kind of the father of astronomical tholins. And uh, using tholin information, tholin optical constants that he's derived uh, years ago, by the way, um, these models are really exceptionally good at predicting not only the continuum and albedo levels, but the detailed spectral shape. So anyway, methane and all these other great molecules in the spectra of both uh, Triton and Pluto. 
Well, the new data represent uh, spectra that are obtained from a, an orbiting uh, telescope, which was uh, launched by the Japanese a few years ago. It was a cryogenic telescope, and now the cryogenic phase is over. But this now opens up a new part of the spectrum that we've never seen before for Triton. And remember, it's just that tiny little faint little dot. Um, so now we have a spectrum that runs all the way from the short wavelength region I showed before out to five micrometers. And it is also very, very rich. I've indicated the general positions of the molecules that absorb. Some of these, of course, most of these are known from the shorter wavelength uh, study done before. But the new one that jumps out is over here at about 4.8 microns, a little bit shy of that. And that is identified as hydrogen cyanide. Now, HCN is a great molecule. It is predicted to be there just on the basis of the processing of the methane and the nitrogen and the carbon monoxide uh, on Triton, both in its thin atmosphere, microbar level atmosphere, and in the ice. But now we can actually see it. We looked for it at the shorter wavelengths, but it was just too weak and we couldn't find it. Um, the Akari spacecraft, which has provided these data, um, has actually two spectral modes, one with a very low resolution uh, prism with a resolution of about 22 and then a resolution of 135 with the grism and the, uh, which is a kind of a prism with a grating on it. And again, the HCN band is the one that's shown over here. So I won't spend time on the details of all that, but now just to uh, ask you to uh, accept that HCN occurs and think a bit about its implications. As I noted before, it is predicted, and in a paper that Krasnopolsky and I published in 95, we modeled the atmosphere, the thin atmosphere of Triton, which was detected by, um, by Voyager in 89. And we deduced that uh, the parent species sublime from the surface because of the fi their finite vapor pressures, and that the photolysis of that thin atmosphere, mainly below 50 kilometers, by uh, ultraviolet light, both from the interstellar medium and from the sun, produces other molecules, such as the C2 hydrocarbons and also HCN. There's also an enormous raft of other molecules that are produced in that process, but the abundances are exceedingly low. Uh, the C2 hydrocarbons and the HCN are, um, are the most abundant ones that fall out of the calculations of a model atmosphere like that. And I won't go through the details of this. It's a complex interaction to form HCN. And this model may not be exactly correct. Um, one of the things missing in a lot of uh, photochemical models are the rate constants for the individual reaction, uh, reactions that occur in the reaction chain to get to your, your final product. Uh, but we used the best that we had available at the time. And we did have a plausible mechanism, which I won't bother to go through here. Delitsky and Thompson also did a similar study earlier and uh, reached basically the same conclusion. <laughs> But in addition to the formation of HCN in a, in a thin atmosphere around Triton, you can process the ice directly and produce HCN in that as well. And in uh, laboratory work done by Moore and Hudson, published recently, they irradiated uh, with, with fairly low energy protons a mixture of, ammonia, uh, sorry, of uh, nitrogen and methane and produced HCN, uh, clearly detected in their spectra, as well as the isomer of that, the HNC. And then they worked out the reaction pathways and so on um, and tried to do a temperature study and, and such. They found the, uh, the, apparent, the occurrence of other nitriles. Uh, HCN is a nitrile, which is, simply indicates that the, the, uh, the nitrogen is bonded with a, with a triple bond to the hydrogen, uh, or in the, yeah, the, the carbon, sorry, in this case. And um, other nitriles, as well as one of interest to the interstellar spectroscopists as well, called OCN minus, which um, has been identified in the interstellar uh, ices. Well now, HCN is a very important molecule because it's a kind of gateway to a lot of reactions and products that are of interest in the astrobiological sense. Now whether or not these kinds of reactions can occur at, uh, at 38 Kelvin is another matter, but there may be places on Triton that are warmer than that. And so I just put up this uh, slightly fuzzy slide to remind us of the ways that uh, HCN can interact with uh, energy and with other molecules to produce glycine, amino acids, polypeptides, pyrimidines, porphyrins, and purines, and all these interesting uh, things in between. So I think that the detection of a, of a photo product of native materials opens up an interesting possibility that we shouldn't overlook 
that uh, Triton is a, is a place of potential astrobiological interest. So briefly a profile of Triton, and this kind of bears on why it's relevant to uh, other objects in the solar system. It's comparable in size to Pluto and Eris, uh, objects that are in the, the trans-Neptunian or cis-Neptunian uh, part of the solar system. It has a geologically young surface uh, that's active uh, in the case of these geysers that are emerging from some kind of vents and depositing dark stuff on the surface. It has a thin atmosphere with a photochemical haze and uh, icy surface uh, containing these five ices that I mentioned before, plus the recently uh, discovered and shown here, HCN. There may be changes in the color and spectrum of Triton on a time scale of years, further testifying to its sort of current activity, and it's probably a captured Kuiper Belt object. Uh, the reason we say that is because it's in a, in a, uh, a retrograde orbit around Neptune that is circular, and uh, so the capture of, of Triton by an early Neptune is the most plausible way that uh, Triton comes to be where it is. And the fact that it's in a circular orbit of low inclination suggests that it has been very heavily processed thermally by the uh, tidal energy of the capture and circularization being dissipated in the form of heat. Well, all of that should have happened long ago, and that should have been, you know, a dead issue, and, and things have, uh, you know, hell should have frozen over by now. <laughs> but it looks, for some reason, like there is some kind of residual energy source in the interior that can mobilize at least some material producing these ejections uh, that we see in the, in the data. And that then brings me to the interesting possibility that that dark stuff coming out um, could possibly be a polymer of HCN. Hydrogen cyanide loves to polymerize if the concentration is high enough, although it may not be, especially when it's in a liquid state. And it produces a black, brownish, uh, gooey residue that, uh, to our limited view, looks a lot like this stuff that's being ejected from the, from the Triton geysers. So I just leave as a, as a s totally speculative possibility that there may be pockets of, of warm regions inside Triton in the near subsurface where uh, HCN has accumulated, polymerized, and for whatever reasons uh, might be uh, being ejected at the present time and giving us these dark streaks on the surface. So as a very broad set of conclusions then, it looks like chemical activity is in progress and doing well on many objects in the outer solar system where we might have thought because of their remoteness and cold, uh, low temperature, uh, nothing would be happening. Uh, we're beginning to detect not only the native materials but process species. And some of these things, as noted here and with the HCN in particular, are of astrobiological interest. Small bodies may be primitive in the sense that they've retained stuff that originated in the interstellar clouds from which the, uh, the sun and, and planets originated. But there may have been processing in the early solar nebula that produced some of this stuff too. And it may be happening, as I say, uh, in the case of the hydrocarbons and the HCN uh, actively at the present time. Spectroscopy from planetary probes and space telescopes has to get better before we can do much more organic and physical chemistry on these objects. Uh, we need more spectral resolution, more spatial resolution, and extended wavelength regions that um, even go beyond what we have with the VIMS instrument and the Ikari spacecraft. But the, the future is very bright because we've now stepped up on the next level to see that we can find not only native species but things that indicate chemical processing that's in progress or has occurred not so long ago and that may be uh, opening the gateway to uh, things of, of very special interest that, uh, that we have now some plausible hope of finding and maybe even eventually understanding. Thank you very much. Um, if I could uh, start off the, the questions, um, uh, are there, is uh, Iapetus the only place where you see the 3.3 micron? Uh, no. Uh, in small cell no, it isn't. We see it uh, clearly on Phoebe, and we see um, hints of it on a couple of other, on, on Hyperion, in the low albedo material of Hyperion. 
and there's a natural tendency to try to connect all these things in terms of the distribution and the origin of it. We're not there yet, but we do at least detect the signatures in, uh, in two other objects. And any evidence for silicates, uh, perxene, or uh, any one micron bands um, that, that you see in these? Well, there are spectral features all the way from 0.3 microns up to about one point, well, let's say 2.5 microns uh, seen in the VIMS data that are unexplained. And people are working on that. And certainly silicates were the first things to come to mind. Uh, Roger Clark, who is a VIMS spectroscopist, is working on the possibility that some of this is iron nanophase, uh, iron, neutral iron, and iron oxides. Uh, but the answer is that we do not have any definitive uh, identification of a silicate, although the story is still not complete. Well, the first uh, relates to Triton, and the, uh, the streaks and geysers are found in the south polar region only. But I have to remind us, including myself, that uh, much of the surface of Triton is very, very young and is probably being exchanged with the atmosphere in basically real time. So I think that uh, any traces, surface traces of, of previous geysers, let's say a billion years ago, may well be gone just because of the redeposition of atmospheric condensates on, on the top, covering it over. So at the present time, we see this only in the South Pole, and the direction of the tails is, is consistent with the sublimation-driven wind at sort of maximum summer, which we are at uh, now in, uh, in the South Pole of, of Triton. And on the Iapetus thing, um, Yeah, where did it come from? Yeah. Yeah. So now that there's that dust that has to end up in Iapetus, how do you explain the, the differences that have been pointed out over mm -hmm. a long time? Well, the current uh, new model or new ideas about Iapetus indicate that um, uh, Iapetus might have started out as a completely icy surface, but with uh, tiny particles of soot entrained in that ice and that some puff of dark material came from an external source, possibly Phoebe, deposited on the leading hemisphere as it moves, and that then triggered a thermal evolution of the surface that resulted in the evaporation of this uh, soot-bearing ice and the redeposition of the, uh, the ice molecules elsewhere, leaving the soot behind as a lag deposit. So the idea is that if the, um, and, and the imaging people claim that they can see a reddish material and a blackish material on Triton, sorry, on uh, Iapetus, and that uh, one may be the trigger material and the other may be the residue from the evaporation and redeposition of the ice elsewhere. It's sort of the best idea on the street, but it's only been on the street for two weeks. So, it's <laughs> <laughs> so we're working on it. I think that the, the simple answer to your question is that we don't yet um, have a satisfactory, fully accepted answer for how it got started or what, but the idea of a thermal uh, redistribution is, is a pretty, uh, pretty compelling one. It's, it's something to work with. Yes? Thank you, Del, for this talk. Um, the detection of HCN on Triton is very interesting, and I'm, I'm, I wonder if, have you used this, uh, the same telescopes to observe Pluto uh, or large transeptinian object, and have you seen the HCN detection as well? It's my understanding that there are Pluto data that have been acquired with this telescope, or will be, but we haven't seen them yet. Okay. Um, Martin, do you know if the Pluto data exist? Yeah, they will come in a few months. Huh? Yeah. So, HCN will not be detectable with New Horizon, right? Because that's correct. That's yeah, it's, uh, the New Horizons going to Pluto covers a different part of the spectrum, okay. and so we can't see this. It's only ground-based telescope. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, a comment and a quick question to which I think there's an obvious answer that I don't know. <clears throat> One is, uh, it's very interesting that you found uh, 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 HCN polymer 
You know, if you've gone to enough pastoral biology meetings, you know that Cliff Matthews always gives a paper telling that that is the source of all good things. <laughs> and in fact, you have a slide that shows, yeah, that's right. It is the source of all good things. Purines, purines, pyrimidines, amino acids, and all the rest. Uh, it sort of brings us to a nice closure on that. Now uh, the question is, it must be obvious, why isn't ammonia a player in all this? Yes. Well, let me first comment about the HCN. And, and I do not contend that we've actually detected the polymer. We've detected the molecule in the frozen state. And the, the step toward polymerization is one that uh, may occur and may not. I mean, we see dirty stuff on the surface that may or may not be connected to the, the polymer of HCN. Um, I'm, of course, aware of, of Cliff Matthews' uh, promotion of HCN polymer as the, the, <laughs> the world's greatest uh, substance, and um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will get a better idea of that, but at the moment, Frank, I think we have to back off from, uh, from the polymer idea as just speculation at this point. Um, and <laughs> ammonia, yes. Why don't we see ammonia? We've, uh, astronomers have been chasing ammonia all over the solar system, as you may know, and it's a very tough one, but it's a very desirable but difficult molecule. It's desirable because in an ice mixture, it lowers the melting temperature and may account for how some kinds of interiors of icy bodies can remain slushy. But once it gets to the surface, it's immediately attacked and destroyed by uh, solar, um, solar ultraviolet. So it can't reside on, a, on an exposed surface where we could see it for long enough for us to catch a glimpse, for the most part. Now, there are some reports. So basically, there are no clear um, indications of ammonia at all on Triton or Pluto. However, on a couple of uh, other more distant objects, and namely Pluto's satellite Charon, there's a band that has been reasonably securely identified as, the, um, as a hydrate of ammonia. Ammonium hydrate uh, has a band that, and it may be more stable over astronomical time periods than pure ammonia. Or it may indicate that there's some kind of activity that's bringing it from the interior to the surface. So one of, the satellite, one of the satellites of Pluto, and uh, also one or two of the trans-Neptunian objects that have names I can't remember. So ammonia is, uh, is desirable, but it's a problem, and it's really tough to find. We have not found any, of, any, any clear evidence on any of the Saturn satellites of ammonia. Uh, but there's an instrumental issue that, um, that may be thwarting us on that. Is the um, cold trapping and thermal segregation that you described on Hyperion, is that similar to what goes on on Callisto? Or is Callisto's temperature just a little bit too warm for that? Callisto's temperature is quite a lot higher. It's 40, 30 degrees higher. Uh, but there must be some kind of uh, trapping of CO2 on Callisto because the band is there. It is shifted. And uh, Hibbets and others have looked at complexing with, with minerals and the dark stuff that may be the, uh, the host of the CO2. But I have a feeling that CO2 is being made molecule by molecule on these planetary surfaces and just happens to stick wherever it finds a source of the hydrogen and source of the carbon, such as on carbonaceous material. Yeah. Just to follow up question on that, where does the band fall for where, do, where does the Callisto band where fall? Does the Callisto band fall? It is shifted. To the other four? It is shifted. Not to the four on. And yeah, but how, I mean, you showed a plot where yeah. you had the, you showed how much the band was shifted for hmm. the four objects that. You know, there's a calibration issue with NIMS on the Galileo that disco discovered that as well. And uh, the resolution is lower uh, to start with, so I don't think we can answer that, but it is clearly shifted. So don't know the, the about amount yet. Yes, Hiroshi. Yeah. So any comments about the isotope? of carbon monoxide on Triton, you mentioned? Uh, I did mention the 13 CO on Triton. It also occurs on Pluto. The problem is in trying to analyze that is that there's an ethane band that falls exactly at that same wavelength. Now, we would love to find ethane, uh, but the fact that the bands are coincident makes it difficult to disentangle them. If we assume that the 13 to 12 carbon ratio is the same on Pluto and Triton as it is here on the Earth, then some of that band must be ethane because the, the CO, 13 CO isn't strong enough to reproduce the band. And there must be an ethane component. But we really need good spectra to longer wavelengths where the other ethane bands occur 
uh, that are less, uh, not so interfered with by, say, methane and other alkanes. Um, but we don't have those data yet, clearly. Uh, now, the new Akari spectrum of, of Triton that I showed, we need to analyze that for ethane as well. And I think that that may give a clearer view of whether or not ethane actually occurs on Triton than we presently have. But that isotope issue is complicated by the, the uh, coincidence of an ethane band right on top of it. <laughs> Any other isotopes of uh, HCN or No, not so far. Uh, possibly the, the OCN minus, that uh, isonitrile uh, adjacent to it, that, that's sufficiently separated. And there is structure in the Triton spectrum at the region of the OCN minus. Uh, we need to work on that as well. So I know it's not going to help with Triton and Pluto, but do the longer wavelengths provided by the Cassini Sears instrument help with uh, the studies of Phoebe and Iapetus? Only in the sense that they are, um, uh, they allow us to do thermal studies of the, um, uh, of, of the black body spectrum basically to get the temperature and also to see the, the temperature um, that is the, the thermal inertia of the surface layer because we sometimes see these things go into and out of eclipse so the temperature's, uh, temperature changes. So the, th the Sears people are using their data in the far infrared, mid to far infrared, not for spectroscopy but instead for studies of the thermal properties of the surfaces. We can't see any bands in those regions um, of the spectrum with the Sears data so far. That's also because they're very broad band. It's a very broad band. Mm -hmm. instrument. True. Correct. Yes. True. So um, uh, is there scope for an instrument on SOFIA perhaps covering the 5 to 15 micron region to look for a, conf a confirmation band for these other these molecules? Yes, we can do quite a bit from SOFIA, but we still have some CO2 above the airplane. So we're not going to find CO2 with that, uh, be able to study that very well. Um, so residual CO2 and water above SOFIA may, may complicate it, but we need to look at that in detail line by line. Well, if there's no further questions, mm -hmm. Dale, uh, as a token of our gratitude for you coming along as a, as a SETI Institute pin, you know uh, that proudly. You. <laughs> well, if, as long as this is worth less than about $5, I can ac <laughs> accept it. But, uh, we, as my, we can say it is, even though we As my it. civil uh, servant right. colleagues know, it's uh, otherwise uh, a felony for me to accept <laughs> it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.